next question, and I'm going to direct it toward uh, Jason. How can God demand no abortion? And he gives a reference here, Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. And yet order the slaughter of people, including children, babies, innocent blood in the Old Testament. Is that hypocrisy on the part of God? satisfied with is knowing where those babies go. Those go, babies go to be with the Lord 
And that gives us some comfort. But I'm going to tell you something. Can you imagine what God's going to do to those who commit abortions um, out of selfishness? Um, one day I would not want to be those people on the day of judgment. Amen to what Jason said. And I would also add that in Romans chapter 9, uh, in verse 14, Paul asked the question, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. God, God does not do anything wrong. So everything that God does is right. And I agree with what Jason said uh, about the eternal destiny of the innocent child that's been slaughtered. But I want you to realize that God judges nations right now. He will judge individuals on the day of judgment. That's why when you go, for instance, like to the book of Daniel, and you go to Daniel chapter 4, and notice this, Daniel chapter 4, notice what it says in verse number 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers, and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and he giveth it to whomsoever he will, and he setteth up over it the basis of men. As you continue to look at what Daniel says, uh, Daniel is saying that God looks at a nation, he judges that nation, and then he will sometimes use another nation to come in and execute his judgment upon that nation. Look at Daniel chapter uh, 5, and notice this was said to a king. Verse 25, this is the writing that was written. Many, many, tekel you farson. This is the interpretation of the thing. Many, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So God said to this king, because of your sinful conduct, because the way you've led this nation, I'm going to allow the Medes and the Persians to come in and conquer you. And that's going to be your punishment. And then, of course, we know that the Medes and the Persians were then conquered by the Grecian army, the Greek army, because of their sin. And then we look at Rome, and Rome came in and conquered Greek because Greece because of their sin, but God is constantly allowing nations to come and go, and God takes them out at His own time. And so the way God does that is not Him stepping in and doing it. He allows, in the instance of the question, uh, the children of Israel to go in, as Jason pointed out a moment ago, to punish these wicked nations. We need to understand. God does not punish innocent nations. God punishes wicked nations. And ultimately, God even allowed the Roman army to come in and Babylon. He allowed the Babylons to come in. But he allowed them to come in and punish the nation of Israel because of those sins. So God is, is setting up kingdoms. He's taking down kingdoms. And we see that throughout the whole Bible. And so God is going to punish those nations. But as Jason said a moment ago, an innocent child that might be caught up in the fray, if we want to use that terminology, might be caught up in this punishment, that child is innocent, and they are not going to be punished eternally. And so understand God is punishing nations right now. And what Jason said a moment ago about in America, when we start looking at our nation, we have allowed abortion on demand because it's an inconvenience to the parent. They want to always throw up, well, what about incest and rape? Very small number actually ever come. A, a, an abortion is because a young lady has been raped or because a young lady has been raped by somebody in an incestuous relation. It's a very small number. But the thousands, the millions that are slaughtered on the altar of convenience, do you think God is not looking at this nation? When we allow homosexuality to become not only 
an alternate lifestyle, but a lifestyle that is now being honored and portrayed as good and right. Do you think God is not looking at this nation? And we could go down the list. We, we talk about, you hear our politicians talk about the opioid crisis, and it is a crisis. And 50,000 Americans lost their life last year to opioid. But do you hear these same politicians that are holding a glass of wine in their hand talk about the al alcohol epidemic? More people die in the United States today, almost twice the number, and it may be even broader because it's hard to get the data, almost twice that many die from alcohol or alcohol-related thing, and that's not alcohol. Just say that. <laughs> I'm just holding that up. <laughs> Even though the country song said something about a red, a red solo cup. But what I'm saying is <laughs> that alcohol causes more death than the opioid crisis, but we don't say anything about it. God will someday judge this nation because of our sin. And the innocent children that might be punished in that will go to heaven, not hell. Wait. I want to mention a couple of verses. First of all, Jonah 4 and verse 11, where God is, of course, um, the Ninevites are set for destruction, and God has spared them, and Jonah is upset because his gourd vine has died. <laughs> and so God reminds him in verse 11, And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six, six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also less cattle. And so God was concerned about the little children in Nineveh. He was concerned about the animals in Nineveh. He was the creator of both of them. The cattle had done nothing wrong. The little children had done nothing wrong. And yet they were going to suffer as a result of the choices that their parents had made and generations had made. And so I think it's, uh, when, we, when we think about these situations where nations were wiped out, they were wiped out because of their sins. They were wiped out because of what they had done wrong. And we may say, well, the children didn't do anything. No, but their parents did. And there are consequences that come when parents decide to disobey God and rebel against God, they're not the only ones that suffer. I mean, no man lives or dies to himself. There are consequences that come. If I have my family in my car and I decide to drink, my family may suffer the consequences of the choice that I made to get behind that wheel. Think about Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 12, where Habakkuk is struggling with some of this, just as we do sometimes. It says, Art not thou from everlasting, O Lord my God? My holy one, we shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. We're going to struggle with some of these things um, from time to time, just as the prophets of God struggle with them. But the ultimate end that we come to is the end that Abraham came to. I know that the judge of all the earth will do right. Amen. Whatever God does is right. That's how I define right. That's how I know what right is, is by the actions of God. Because God's of too pure eyes even to look on sin, much less be guilty of sin or be a partaker in it. Alright. Brother Tom? You have to keep in mind when Israel was conquering the land of Canaan, that the various nations that were there, uh, most of their idolatrous practice involved some kind of uh, sexual sin. Right. And along with that came venereal diseases that contaminated the whole population. There are occasions when God would allow children and women to be spared, and other occasions when He did not allow anyone to be spared. It's highly likely that the reason for not sparing women and children in some cases is that the whole of that population had become contaminated with some kind of a nerial or some kind of a plague that uh, demanded the elimination of an entire society in order to protect Israel after they got into the land. 
All right, we're going to go to our next question. Uh, if a person's pay cycle falls on one check a month, can they give as prospered in one lump sum uh, right then, or do they need to divide it up in order to give upon the first day of every week, as per 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2? Brother Kerry. <laughs> Well, let's turn and read 1 Corinthians chapter 16. So, so the question is, if a person's pay cycle falls on one check a month, can they give as they prospered in one lump sum rather than... Uh, Right then, I'm sorry, one lump sum right then, or do they need to divide it up uh, to give upon the first day of the week per 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 10? Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, I mean 1 and 2, I'm sorry. Uh, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Uh, this is one of those things that we get into the Romans chapter 14 that Jason mentioned earlier that uh, it gets into a matter where I have to make sure that in my own mind as a Christian, I have settled this question. Uh, it may be the case that in your mind you've decided that since I'm giving on this, let's say you get paid on the, the, the first week of the month and you give your lump sum on that Sunday, then you, you might say, well, I haven't prospered for the rest of the month, and so I've given as I've prospered. Personally, I don't agree with that, and I believe that Paul is saying that this needs to be done so every week, so that Paul says, when I come, the money's going to be there. So what about the person? that Paul comes on the fourth Sunday of the month and he doesn't come on the first Sunday of the month. And so there's money there that Paul is saying that needs to be used to the glory of God. Uh, so I would say that just do you buy a month's worth of groceries on that first week when you get paid or do you parcel it out over the month? Uh, do you spend your gas money? Do you go buy all your gas that week or do you parcel the money out and, and have a budget that you follow and say, so you can get paid one lump sum and then budget it out over the rest of the month, just like you do any other uh, thing that you do. And so I, I think Paul is saying that this needs to be done. It needs to be done every first day of the week. Every week has a first day of the week, and that's what it seems to me the language of 1 Corinthians 16 is that you, you budget it out if you get a lump sum, no doubt. Think about the farmer. He goes all year and then he gets the harvest. Well, does he spend all his, does he buy all his groceries for a year at that time? Or does he budget it out over the rest of the year? So we can do that with giving as well. It's an opinion. Yeah, um, yeah. At the end of the day, it's an opinion, but I would say this much. Um, the other side would simply say, well, why, why do you withhold your money over a year? Just give it all to God, you know, up front so he has it quicker. Uh, but I would also add this. There's something about the consistency of the daily action in worship. I know me personally, uh, if I'm away somewhere on the Lord's Day, I'm still going to give something, even though we may send my wives back home giving our normal contribution because I want to participate in one of the clear acts of worship to God. So I don't know why, even if you gave most of it, you wouldn't wait and give at least some, or give extra. Why not just give extra every week if you have to, um, as a consistent pattern, being involved in the worship of God on a weekly basis. I would also say this much. If you don't give every week, think about the example. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, uh, Paul told Timothy to be an example of the believers. Word, conversation. Uh, charity, spirit, faith, purity, conversations, the way you live, your lifestyle. And so what if someone sees me 51 weeks of the year not give? Not that they should be watching what I'm giving, but people do. Young people do. 
And, uh, you know, those young men may be waiting on the table and they keep passing the plate. Here I am, an elder of the church for 51 weeks. They see me, my wife, no one put anything in the plate. They, they would, man, that, that's kind of odd. So maybe even for example's sake, use some wisdom there. The only thing I would add is I think it's a good reminder to me as I give every week of just how much God blesses me every day and every week. And uh, not to say that you couldn't do that given one time a month, but I like the reminder of every week that God has given me food this week, He's given me air this week, given me all the things I need this week. And I need to always take account of that, count my blessings, and it's a way of reminding me to do that. Anything else to go to Tom? All right, next question. You know who this is, Brother Wade. Uh, does true repentance always involve confessing all or all details to any and all parties or parties involved or wrong, you know? Uh, assume that in such a case restitution is made. Could confession of all or all details do more harm than good? I don't, I don't like it when people say, if I have sinned, or if I have done this, or if I have done that, you know, hedging on the front end. But, but having said that, um, if we confess sin, if we confess that we have sinned, if we confess that we have brought shame or reproach upon the name of Christ, 1 Peter 4, 14 through 16, uh, then we have confessed what must be confessed. And I do think sometimes it is detrimental, it is hurtful uh, to, to go into specific details. I don't think that's necessary. God obviously knows the sin. You know the sin. You're confessing sin, confessing sin that's public nature, confessing sin that is um, has brought reproach upon the church. You're confessing that. Um, not hedging on that, not saying if I have or I haven't been a good example, you know, the things that sometimes people say. You know, be specific. Don't say like Saul said. That's the best way I know to say it. I played the fool. Well, just admit you played the fool. Admit your sin, and then ask for forgiveness of that. Um, you know, who's going to determine how many details are enough details? You know, if you're confessing sin, uh, because if you confess some details or whatever of the sin, somebody's going to say there's more details to it, or there's more that didn't come out, and therefore you didn't fully repent or really repent because I know a detail you, you didn't bring out or whatever. Um, we're, we're not in a position to, to second guess that or pick that apart. That's Luke chapter 17 and verses 3 through 5. If you repent, forgive him. And if you repent and if you confess that sin, then that sin will be forgiven. And God's faithful and just to do that doesn't necessitate you going to every single detail uh, that may have been a part of that sin. Well, I, I think there's a couple of things at play, and I, I agree with everything that Wade said. Uh, if I have sinned, let's say I've sinned against Norman Thomas, then I need to go to Norman Thomas, and it may be that I need to tell him the details of the sin that I've committed. He may not know all that was involved. He may know that I've sinned against him, but he may not know all of it. So when I'm dealing with a brother, I need to make sure that brother understands what I've done and that I'm repenting of that. And I think when you look at Matthew 18, it says, If thy brother trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So I think when we're talking about repentance and confession, if I've done something against Jason, Jason, I need to go to Jason. I need to make that right. Now, what about to the church? Well, they don't need to know all the details. The congregation doesn't have to know all the details, but if I have brought reproach upon the church in the way that I've dealt with this brother, then I need to get it right with this brother, but then I go, and as James said in James 5 and verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for the, another for ye, uh, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So there's two sides to this. I need to be as specific as I can with Jason and what I've done is wrong. But then when I come before the church, there's nothing wrong with saying, I sinned against my brother Jason. And he and I have talked about it. We've made that right. And now I want you to pray for me because I want your forgiveness as well because you may have, you may know some of the things that are involved. 
I think what Wade said a moment ago, I, I remember the first place I preached, we had an instance where uh, a man had gotten involved with one of the ladies, uh, single ladies. He was a married man. And, and I'm talking about, you know, a, a sexual relationship. And so uh, the elders, I, I, it was first brought to my attention. So, so I, I went to the elders and we talked about it. We went to this man at first, he denied it. Ultimately, he said that he did it. So we talked to the lady as well. And, and I'll never forget, the lady came up and she confessed and it, and it was almost embarrassing. I, I thought for a minute she was going to actually get into details of what, you know, I'm like, okay, that's, you know, that's enough. We don't need to know all the details. But then after a month of the elders going to this man and him still not repenting, he finally came forward and then pulled one like Wade said, well, you know, if I've sinned, I know I haven't been a good father and I haven't been a good, well, that's not specific. <laughs> I mean, you left the congregation, you've got the woman saying this, and then you got the man up there, well, if I've done something to, you know, I haven't been a good dad, I haven't been a good uh, husband, well, no, you need, to, you need to say, I have sinned against my wife, I've sinned against my children, not going to tell you the details of that, but I want you to know that I'm repenting of that sin, so as he said a moment ago, I think sometimes we can drag out details and people are going to be hurt, no need for that. <laughs> But then don't hide behind this thing. Well, if, if you think I've done something wrong, then I'm sorry you feel that way. That, that to me, doesn't fit. I would just say, a lot of those passages, 1 John chapter 1, where it talks about uh, that if we say we have not sinned, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. And yet if we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just to give. Psalm 51, in verse uh, number... Three, David said, this is the background of sin with Bathsheba. He says, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Verse 4, against thee and thee only have I sinned. I understand there's a sense in which sin is against other people, but it's also ultimately against God. And so if it is a sin in the sense of the Matthew 18 situation, you need to go and make that right. They need to understand your true repenting. It's not if I've sinned, but I have sinned, brother, against you. I thought Wade had a good point too. If you became too... Um, rigid about this. Oh, I want every, you have to confess every detail. How are you going to do that? Yeah. How are you going to confess every detail? Okay, you, you confess 15 details and then you get home and go, ah, oh, I forgot about that other day when I had a thought about this. I need to go back and so every Sunday I just have more details, I guess. <laughs> I mean, that's impossible. So common sense would come into play. I know if you look up the term confess or confessing, you see that they came to John's baptism confessing their sins. You see in the book of Nehemiah and Ezra, they were confessing their sins. Uh, I think sometimes there certainly are some specifics, but I don't believe there's every specific. Um, you, when you get to be an elder, you hear things that if all the details came out, uh, you know, especially working with young people, college kids, whatever, it, that's not going to help anybody. The key is, did this young person repent of their sin? And also the Crossroads Movement tried to use this idea of getting confessions and it's interesting because what they would do is they say you have to have a prayer partner. And so the older prayer partner would listen to the confessions of the younger prayer partner, but it never reversed. Yeah. You know? But the Bible says in James 5, confess your faults one to another. Okay. So I believe that, that public sin needs a public confession. Private sin, you need private uh, uh, repent, confession and repentance. Some of these sins only God knows about. Others, brethren, know about. You need to get, get taken care of. But the idea of taking every detail into account in every situation, that, that's impossible. Yeah. So I believe common sense comes into play with some of this and a lot of all these passages that we've looked at. All right. Where is Jason? In light of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 13, when people are openly supporting, defending, and fellowshipping both spiritually and recreationally, their fam family members who are in sin very publicly, and not at all repentant, what should our response be to these putting that family member before God? Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. Matthew 10, 37 says, if you love father and mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. And so I would assume that they're talking about members of the family who are not, I mean, who are Christians. Um, I don't know if it specifies that. Family members who are in sin very publicly uh, and not at all repentant. Okay, well, if they're members of the church, you handle them differently than if they're not members of the church. As it says in this passage, 1 Corinthians 5, verse number 10, 
He said, verse 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, not yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I've written unto you uh, not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a raider, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one no not to eat. It says in verse 13, Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. If you go back to Matthew, the 10th chapter, let's look at the exact language there in Matthew, the 10th chapter. And it says in verse number 34, Matthew 10, 34, Think not that I have come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword, even though he's the prince of peace. There's peace used different ways. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foe shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Um, and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. The passage seemed clear to me. And let's say you have someone who's in your home. Let's say my son, my oldest son. Both my boys are members of the church. Let's say Jackson uh, were to fall away from the faith. I'm going to work to restore him. There's a time there that I'm going to deal with, you know, Jackson, what are you doing? Come on, son, let's, you know, get, that, get yourself right. But what if he rebels? What if he continues to live in apostasy and continues to just live a wicked life even though he knows better? He's preached sermons. He's a member of the church. He's a Christian. Am I just going to ignore that? Well, that's Thanksgiving. How you doing? How you doing, Jackson? I uh, hope you're doing well. He's going to hell the whole time. He knows better. And I'm just going to ignore that. A lot of 1 Corinthians 5, I don't understand that. I think there's a lot of people in the church that are going to lose their soul for overlooking the sin in their family's lives. A lot of people that are going to lose their soul because at the end of the day, they ignore the sin in their family's lives. Not non-Christians, Christians. They ignore it. I'm not saying there's not a time you deal with it more gentle than at other times you're more direct. I know what I'm talking about. I have a family member who is a faithful Christian. But this person at one time was not a faithful Christian. They were a faithful Christian who went into apostasy. And there were people, even in my own family, who were overlooking it, ignoring it, acting, you know, acting like it would just go away. And I gently dealt with it for a time. And then the time came, I said, this is enough. And I wrote a letter to this person, and I said, I will not be fellowshipping with you anymore. If you continue this, I'll still treat you like a brother. Come on, you like a brother. But I, at Christmas, Thanksgiving etc. Believe me, when you see me coming, it's not just going to be to eat turkey and ask how football's going, what your favorite team is. It's going to be to admonish you as a brother and tell you you need to repent. And um, I don't know if that fully had to do with it, but I think it had something to do with him returning, this person returning. And, and, and where there were others who seemed to be just ignoring the fact. So I'm not going to get into a person's business of exactly the nature of how they do it. There's, there's some some approaches there that, that may require some patience and then other times not as much patience. Um, I know recently there was a person who was restored to the cause of Christ that was fellowshipping openly with family who knew better. It got exposed. This person now has repented of those things and was brought back to the Lord. Ignoring sin does not fix sin. And we need to know Jesus meant what He said in Matthew 10 and 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, I, I, I'll give one more example that I've heard about. There was a, a husband and wife, and, and the husband fell away. Faithful Christian fell away. What is she going to do? She still has obligations as a wife. She has obligations as a mother. She has obligations in that marriage. And it's maybe one of the best, best uh, live examples that I've heard of. And supposedly this sister in Christ, she was still a wife to her husband. She was still a mother to her children. But when it came time to eat, she would eat in another room as a way to publicly protest to him, you still aren't right with God. I want you to come home. I want you to repent. I love you. She was kind to him. She, she, she slept with him. Everything else she was supposed to do as a wife. But she did that in reflection of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 as a, as a way to let him know until you come home, you're not right with God. 
I thought that was a pretty marvelous example of how to handle such a terrible, tough situation, but she did not ignore it. Carrier, wait. Go ahead. It's difficult any time you deal with family members, and but those family members, if you're doing what you are supposed to be doing, they probably don't want to see you coming <laughs> because they they know um, that you're their brother, you're you're their you have that relationship with them physically, but spiritually speaking, you cannot be in fellowship with them. You cannot approve of what they're doing. And so they know that. If, if they don't know that, then you're not doing what you need to be doing. But, but if you are talking to them every time you're with them and you're telling them, I'm praying for you, I want you, to, I want you to repent, I want you to come back, I want you to do right, then those are opportunities every, every time you're around them. That's not to get together to have fun. That's times where you have to be together. There are times you have to be together. Let's say, for example, that uh, a father is dying. There are, there are two brothers, and one of them is faithful to the Lord, the other is not faithful to the Lord. They both may very well be in that same hospital room at that time. And there's not time for an argument, it's not time for a disagreement, it's not time to be ugly or make that situation worse. But both of those brothers are clear on where they stand and what's right and what's not right. And um, it's just like at a funeral, you know, that's not the time to protest something. But outside of that funeral, I'm going to have a talk. I'm going to have a discussion. You're going to know what what my feelings are based upon the scriptures of what my fellowship with you can be. So we're not talking about going to ball game together. We're not talking about going fishing together, going to hunting together, doing any recreation. We're talking about the times in life where you have to be in that situation. But you're, you're making very clear what the Bible teaches about what they need to do. It's a matter of love. You should love them more than anybody else loves them. I love my brother more than more than I love anybody, and so if I love my brother that way, then love is chastening him, is correcting him, is trying to help him to repent. I'm not helping him to repent if I'm making him feel as if he's okay as he is. I accept him as he is, and if, if I'm going along with it, I'm not helping him. I'm hurting him, and so I think Jason's, you know, giving giving the advice there. In the sense that you have a physical relationship, you have responsibilities in that relationship, but you make a clear distinction between the responsibilities that you have in the relationship and just having time alone with them where you're fellowshipping and having fun. And that's what the question seems to me to be talking about. These are people that are recreationally doing things together as if nothing's wrong. And I cannot act as if nothing is wrong because something is very seriously wrong. I would also add, we need to be careful in looking at a situation and seeing, maybe you see them going out and doing something together and assuming that they're not trying to deal with this person's sin. Uh, the Bible says in uh, 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 15, I think both guys referenced this, but it says, talking about this brother who sinned, and I know it's not a brother in the flesh, it's a spiritual brother, but he says, count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So, so as I, I deal with someone in sin, I'm not harsh, I'm not ugly, I'm trying, my ultimate goal is to bring them back to the Lord. Now, in the illustration that Jason gave a moment ago about this person that says, I don't care what the Bible says, I'm going to go ahead and do whatever it is that I'm doing. Then I think you look at Jude and you see that in Jude 1, he says in verse 21, of course it's Jude chapter 1 because there's only one chapter, but he says in Jude uh, verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life and of some have compassion making a difference and others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. I think we see a couple of scenarios. You've got the one person that is rebellious, and they say, I don't care what the Bible says. Then you snatch them out of the fire. You know, you grab them by the garment. You, you've got to deal. I think Dennis... <clears throat> Were we together the night coming back from Will's Point when we saw the house on fire? Were you, were you with us that night? 
we, we driving, we're coming back from Wills Point to Maybank, and it's a group of us boys, and we drive by a house, and we see a house on fire. It was late, so we go and we, do you think that's the way we knocked on the door? No, we're screaming fire, your house is on fire, we're banging, we're honking our horns, we're trying, and sometimes that's what you got to deal with, bro. You've got to say, hey, you know, brother, look, do you realize what you're doing is going to, and, and their reaction is going to be how I'm going to deal with this, so how am I going to treat that individual? I'm going to treat him, admonishing him as a brother, but I'm also going to try to snatch him out of the fire. And so we, we deal with people in different, Jason's got a different personality than what I've got. And, and we both have different personality than what Wade has. And so I don't know what Wade is trying to do to get this brother to come back. You don't know what Jason's trying to do. You don't know what I'm trying to do. So be very careful in looking at it and say, well, they're just, they, they don't care. That person's doing this and they don't even care. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes. So be very careful and not thinking that just because that person you see them eating at a restaurant together and they're laughing and singing and they'll have a good time, don't automatically assume that they, they're not doing anything to try to get this person to repent. So I, I think when, in light of the way that's worded, I think we need to be careful that we're not making a harsh judgment against Jason because Jason's not doing it the way I do it. And Jason's not looking at me and saying, well, Carrie, that's not the way I would do it. Well. I'm not you, and you're not me, so we deal with it with the principles of the Bible, and we recognize I have a family relationship with this person. This is my flesh and blood. I have to see them. Going back to the husband and wife, she can't just walk out of the house and never talk to this guy again. She's got to do what she can in the position that she's in to try to get him to come back. All right, last question. Please explain the phrases greatest in the kingdom of heaven and least in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Brother Kerry. What was the verse? I think that may be a 19 because that would make more sense. Okay. Because <laughs> it says... Uh, in verse 17, think not I'm, that I am come, or think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And then verse 19, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I think what Jesus is dealing with, first of all, is the Old Testament law. And uh, he's saying, if I, if I understand that the person that Jesus is speaking to under the Old Testament law, your attitude toward the law is going to be manifested when you become a Christian. If you look at the law of Moses, and that's the law he's talking about, that's the law he's dealing with, if you look at it and you say, ah, eh, well, you know, it's no big deal. I, I can, I, if I don't want to uh, give, then it's no big deal. Well, if you do become a member of the Lord's church, is that going to be your attitude toward this New Testament dispensation? And so I think he's dealing with an attitude and a wrong attitude, but I also think that it gets to the fact that there are going to be, if I understand right, differences of rewards on the day of judgment. The person that has dedicated every ounce of their being to the church is going to be rewarded. And I think they're going to have a great reward. The one who just, and I, I don't mean this flippantly, the one who just gets by, well, they're not going to have the same reward as the person. Just like in hell, I believe the Bible teaches there are various degrees of punishment in hell. The one that uh, is like Hitler, who has 
orchestrated the mass murder of millions of people is not going to be punished, if I understand right, for the same as the person who just didn't obey the gospel. They weren't a bad person. They weren't an immoral person, but they didn't obey the gospel. Well, they're going to be lost. But are they going to have the same degree of punishment as others? I don't think so. So I think he's dealing with rewards and punishment and saying one person is going to be rewarded where the other person is not going to have that same reward. In Matthew, the 11th chapter, he says in verse number um, 11 regarding John the baptizer, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Speaking of the fact of New Testament Christians um, and how great the New Testament kingdom is, as opposed to him being the forerunner of Jesus, to make again make sure that we understand what we've been given, which goes back to the uh, great spiritual blessings of Ephesians chapter 1, or the better covenants, the, the, the better things in the book of Hebrews. Going back to the reward and punishment situation, the Bible speaks of few stripes and many stripes. It also speaks of James chapter 3, that teachers, it says, Be not ye many masters or teachers, knowing you shall receive the greater condemnation. So there's greater opportunity maybe, but there's also a reward, but there's also greater punishment if you don't teach the truth. I think about the 1 Corinthians chapter 3 where he's dealing with conversions and those who are converted to the Lord and he likens it unto different types of precious uh, stones and elements. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about uh, God gives the increase, verse 6, verse 10, according to the grace of God which is given unto me, I'm in 1 Corinthians 3, 10, as a wise master, master builder I have laid at the foundation but another buildeth their own. But let every man take heed how he buildeth their own. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Christ Jesus. Now if any man build upon the foundation, what's the distinctions here? Gold, silver, precious stones. Well, that's all pretty good, but it's not all the same. Compared to wood, hay, and stubble. Every man's work, we're dealing with conversions and other conversions, other people being converted because of my evangelism. Every man's work shall be made manifest, made known, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, so yet is but by fire. If I bring people to the Lord and they fall away, it's going to hurt me, but I'm not going to be lost. But what about those who don't fall away? What about the work of the kingdom I do that is, um, is that is, is that going to be all the same? Now, you think about that, the, the parable Jesus gave or the teaching Jesus gave when people labored all day and they all received the same payment. Well, that's a reward. But there's still differences of experience. I think with Brother Waycaster, I'm teaching the book of Ephesians right now. And the more I study Ephesians, the more I realize how deep that book is. He's got an amazing commentary on the book. I'm reading fairly right, widely in my studies. I like to do that. And I, of course, uh, the other day I had I'm in my reading chair there, and I have my Bible, and I have all my books everywhere, and I, I'm studying. And, and uh, Julia said something to me about reading, and I said, well, I'm reading all these books, but this is the book that I compare them all to, because the answers are in this book, the Bible. But what I'm trying to say is that all the work that Brother Waycaster is doing, is that not somehow through his experience, his knowledge, his understanding going to come into eternity, maybe, maybe greater perhaps than mine would be in some of his experiences, maybe in other ways I have experiences he doesn't have? I don't fully understand all that. All I know is that if we are in the kingdom of heaven, it says even if we're the least, Jesus says we're even considered in some sense greater than John the baptizer. That alone ought to humble us. I just want to make one comment about the least of the commandments. Matthew 23 and verse 23. What do you describe in Pharisees hypocrites for you pay tithe of men and anise and cumin and have neglected, neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. And so they, they were hung up on, they were mi majoring in minors and minoring in majors and sometimes I think we do that and I think sometimes we neglect the weightier matters of the law, the bigger matters of the law, 
Was it good to give uh, a tithe of these spices? Absolutely. If you want to do that, that's a great thing for you to do, to give a tithe of the smallest spices you have. But don't do that to the neglect of some of the greater things, judgment, mercy, and faith. Don't leave those undone. You want to do the little things, do those little things, but make sure you do the big things as well. And I think sometimes we get hung up on some of the least of these and forget about the greater requirements. Well, and I, I would add amen to that. And if you read on, and I stopped reading at verse 19, but in verse 20, and this really plays off what Wade just said, he says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So I think when you look at all of this, he's talking about our attitudes about different things. And he's telling these people, look, if you don't, if you don't get better than these scribes and Pharisees, you're not even going to make it into the church. Well, appreciate these men uh, stepping up today. Yeah, brother, brother, brother Tom. Make it perfectly clear that Jason does not get in. I do want to say this much, though. Whenever I get my mansion up there, uh, I will get some credit, maybe, because of all of those commentaries. If you go back and read the ones in the book, in the Psalms, you got all those volumes in the Psalms, and it refers in the first volume to the students that threaten to tar and feather him if he doesn't write those commentaries. Well, I was one of those students. So I'm hoping I get a little bit of credit for that, yeah. based on those reports. <laughs> well, we certainly appreciate uh, the job that. Uh, Brother Kerry and Jason and Brother Wade have done on question and answer. And I know that we've all benefited from the study together. And I hope that you'll utilize the uh, information that we've made available. It's important uh, that we deal with Bible things in Bible ways. And I appreciate uh, all that they've done for us this afternoon. Uh, we're going to be taking a, a, a longer break. We'll be uh, re coming back here at 6 o'clock. And we'll be having a period of singing. And then uh, following that uh, singing, we'll be having our first session. And during that first session, Brother Kerry Clark's going to be presenting a study on Old Testament priest, New Testament priest. And so I would encourage everyone to come back and be a part of that. Uh, we appreciate all of you who are in attendance here this afternoon and hope you'll make your plans to be back with us later on. Uh, I'd like to ask Robert Osborne if he would lead us in a closing prayer. And I was also given a note by uh, Sister Macy Dossie. Uh, her boss's cousin uh, had emergency surgery in Shreveport. Uh, her, her boss is a member at the uh, Centerville Congregation, I believe. Uh, but he had uh, emergency heart surgery in Shreveport. He's only 26 years old, uh, has a young wife and two little children. Uh, his name is Torin Hart, and we've been requested to remember him in our prayers. And so as you uh, lead us in the closing prayer, remember...